Thank you for coming. And uh, we're, we're here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Foy Funger Memorial Library. How is that? Are you all hearing me? Great. Um, to commemorate the tremendous vision and donation of Mata Foy Funger to USC to honor her late husband, Leon Foy Funger, the world-renowned German-Jewish writer. We're really grateful to have you here today with us to recognize the bequest of Mata Foy Funger that dated from 1960 and for the August 31st, 1995 dedication of the Foy Funger Memorial Library. We have just as a little aside in the little vitrine out there outside the front door, we have some mementos from that actual dedication ceremony as well as some, some materials from the Mata Foy Funger papers that you might find interesting. Gives you a little bit of insight into her very interesting personality and, 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 and interests. So due to the pandemic, this celebration was postponed for two years. So we're really actually celebrating the 27th anniversary, but we're calling it the 25th <laughs> because that's such a nice number. Um, and so, but, so we've been on kind of hold for two years until we were able to come together to combine this. And we're now able to combine this historic event with the 10th Biennial International Feuerfanger Society Conference, which begins tomorrow in earnest. And the conference title, for those of you who don't know, is Women in Exile, Feufunger and Gender Dynamics in Exile and Exile Literature. And we would like to recognize, but he's not quite here yet, but also to thank the Deputy Counsel Dirk Schultz of the German Consul General of Los Angeles, who's graciously uh, sponsored this event. And we'd also like to welcome and thank, he's not quite here yet, we hope he will join us, the, dean, uh, the, the library's new dean, uh, Andrew Guzman, for his support. A writer and scholar, Leon Feufanger was a voracious book collector who loved having his own books to consult while researching his historical novels. Feufanger's library in Los Angeles, and only one part of it is here, or a very small part of it is here on display in this room. It reached some 30,000 volumes, um, period. And the, the library actually represents the third of Feufanger's libraries. The first one was in Berlin that was confiscated by the Nazis in 1933 when Hitler became chancellor. At that time, the National Socialists confiscated all of Feufanger's possessions, including his, his citizenship. Leon and Mata Feufanger, his wife, were exiled to southern France for the rest of the 1930s, uh, where Leon continued to write, to publish, and to collect, to buy books and collect books. So that second library reached around 8,000 volumes. He had to leave behind when they fled to the United States after he escaped from the internment camp Lamy. Uh, he, he began, when he got in Los Angeles, he began collecting again with renewed vigor, uh, and we have lots of book catalogs to show the things that he was looking at and, and selecting from when he arrived in Los Angeles. Although, and a number of the books that he had in France were shipped over later and came to him, but they were in really poor condition because of the way they were being stored um, near the ocean. So we don't really have uh, that many from that collection, at least that I'm aware of. For me, this library, then, Feufanger's library, symbolizes both a passion for knowledge and resilience. So in addition to Feufanger's book collections of rare books covering European literatures, history, and biblical studies, among other topics, Marta's donation to USC also included, included um, Feufanger's manuscripts and a massive collection, uh, a collection of correspondence with friends, uh, fellow exiles, intellectuals, and others. And also included in this donation was um, papers of fellow exiles who were in Los Angeles, writer Heinrich Mann and composer Hans Eisler. After uh, Leon's death in 1958, Marta realized the importance of preserving her husband's library and papers for students and researchers and scholars in the future. So she reached an agreement with USC in 1960 and uh, was able to continue to live in her home, Villa Aurora, and share the materials in their home mostly the library, with visitors and researchers. She, she, and she survived him by three decades or thereabouts. So after her death in 1987, the rarest books um, of the library were moved here to USC, and, and the rest of the collection remains on permanent loan at Villa Aurora. In the early 1990s, USC sold Feufanger's um, home to friends of Villa Aurora with an arrangement so the Feufanger's books Furnitures and artwork could remain on permanent loan there. The sale of the house allowed for the, this wing of the Doheny Memorial Library to be renovated to establish the Feufanger, oh, yeah, the Feufanger Memorial, Memorial Library here um, as an integral part of special collections. 
Since the Feuerfang Art Memorial Library was founded, we've continued to build its book and archival collections of German-speaking exiles to Los Angeles and the United States. And we established a research grant in the 1990s that supports students and researchers to come to the USC to consult the exile studies collections. And in the early 2000s, the library co-founded the International Feuerfanger Society with tremendous support from Ian Wallace, a respected German scholar based in the UK. And now it's my honor to turn this over to my colleague, Michaela Ullmann, the German, uh, exile studies librarian. And, uh, I'll, and I'll take a <laughs> <here. laughs> Oh, playing tag team. Um, when I arrived in Los Angeles in 2006 to become the Feuchtwanger curator, really following in, in Maya's um, large footsteps, I did not expect to be very busy. Who would come to Los Angeles to study German-speaking exiles in Los Angeles? <laughs> Man, was I wrong. <laughs> Today, our exile studies collections are some of the most used collections here in Special Collections. They are not just consulted by researchers from around the globe. They are also heavily used in teaching. Classes from disciplines such as history, music, art history, journalism, Jewish studies come every semester to use the archival and book collections related to the German-speaking exile experience in Los Angeles. And classes from other local universities, universities such as UCLA and California State University Long Beach are amongst our frequent visitors as well. In addition, as, um, in addition to the scholarly work, we have seen quite a few successful creative collaborations as well. The one standing out the most is our collaboration with, of many years with Professor Oliver Mayer in our USC School of Dramatic Arts. Through our series Feuchtwanger Refreshed, students and professors have been creating new creative performances inspired by our archival collections and Feuchtwanger's writing. In my own teaching, I get to experience firsthand what an inspiration the stories of the German-speaking exiles are for our students. In my freshman seminar, Exile and Resistance, then and now, we regularly keep a deep dive into the various paths of exile and the many different ways of resistance that not just the popular writers, but also their wives and the lesser known exiles chose to fight back against the Nazi regime. I regularly observe and hear that our students who live in challenging and often bleak times the stories of the German-speaking exiles provide hope and inspiration. This all would not be possible without the generous gift and the foresight of Martha Feuchtwanger when she bequeathed the Feuchtwanger Memorial Library to USC. And we thought it's only fitting that today Martha's bust will return to the Feuchtwanger Memorial Library from her, from her long-term loan at Villa Aurora. It is thus my pleasure to welcome Dr. Claudia Gordon from Villa Aurora, who will provide a short background about the bust and its return to USC. Thank you, Michaela. I'm very happy to see you here and uh, even happier that you'll all hopefully be um, at the villa on Saturday um, to continue this conference. Um, and now I'm going to tell you how it came about that this lady, <laughs> this likeness of Marta Feuchtwanger actually um, has come to the library um, from a long-term loan, as Michaela mentioned, to the Villa Aurora. If you've been there before, you will remember that she uh, greets visitors as you enter uh, the first floor. And um, she still does that, and I'm going to explain why. Um, we were actually contacted by the heirs of the gentleman who is the sculptor of this bust, a gentleman by the name of Paul Conrad. And if you're from Los Angeles, this name might uh, be familiar to you in a totally different um, context. This is him, actually. He was for a long time the LA Times editorial cartoonist, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, so very, I brought two of his cartoons. I'm going to leave them right there. They're eerily uh, relevant still today. So um, a very well-known... Um, a very well-known artist, and he um, made the sculpture of Martha Feuchtwanger. Um, he passed away in 2010, unfortunately, and after his wife also passed, 
his children um, actually found another copy of uh, Martha's bust uh, in their possession, and they decided that they were going to give it to the Villa Aurora. So now we have our own Martha, <laughs> who is in the old place, and this one is actually going to be watching over the library and over all of us today. So that makes us very happy. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's really nice and it was very timely that this happened just about, you know, the time that we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the library. It is now my honor to introduce our speaker for tonight, Birgit Maya Katkin, um, who is a longtime member of the International Feuchtwanger Society and the editor of the Journal for Feuchtwanger and Exile Studies. Birgit Maya Katkin is also a prof an associate professor, or in her main job, she is an associate professor of German in the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics at Florida State University. Her research centers on 20th and 21st century German literature with a special focus on exile writers, cross-cultural topics, as well as memory, border, and human rights studies. She has published numerous articles, among them essays on Leon and Martha Feuchtwanger, Karl Suckmeier, Anna Segas, Walter Benjamin, Hannah Arendt, and Yoko Tawada. Her book, Silence and Acts of Memory, examines literature's contribution to historical memory. Currently, she's working on a book about Sino-German cross-cultural relationships with a special focus on Jewish exiles in Shanghai. In addition to language courses, she teaches seminars on German literature and culture with a concentration on human rights and transcultural themes. Birgit will present a talk entitled Feuchtwanger's Ingenuity, Memorializing Leon Feuchtwanger. Please give her a hand and welcome Birgit. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's quite an honor to speak tonight as we're honoring Martha Feuchtwanger. So Martha Löffler encountered Leon Feuchtwanger for the first time in 1909, shortly before her 19th birthday, when at the invitation of her friend Franziska Feuchtwanger, Leon's sister, she attended a house party at the Feuchtwanger home. Three years later, on May 22, 1912, the couple married and stayed together until Leon's death in 1958. Throughout their 46 years of marriage, Mata gave Leon her undivided support. This continued well beyond his death. So after a quick introduction into Mata's life, my talk will focus on the years after Leon's death, when Mata began to manage Leon's literary estate and promote his legacy as a major German writer. From her place of exile in Los Angeles, she reached out to a widespread international community, not only to promote Leon's literary work, but also to create research opportunities for future exiles. My presentation asks, how did Mata influence Leon's legacy? What initiatives did she start? Which contacts did she promote? What institutions did she initiate and what legacy did she create for Leon, for herself and for the field of exile studies? In this way, it examines how the woman who stood by Leon's side throughout a large portion of his life became one of the most outspoken proponents of his work and legacy. In 1891, Mata Feuchtwanger was born the third child to a family of Jewish textile merchants in Munich. I realize I don't have a baby picture, but this is good enough. <laughs> Starting in her youth, she was a compassionate athlete interested in gymnastics and all sorts of sports activities, which lasted into her old age. Spurred on by his wife, even Leon engaged in daily exercise until the end of his life. In 1909, Marta met Leon at a house party. Three years later, the two of them married when it became apparent that Marta was pregnant. Sadly, their baby girl contracted typhoid fever and died shortly after birth. After a long honeymoon through Europe and Africa, Leon devoted himself to his writing career. During their early years of marriage, Leon published his novel A Volk Success in 1930, in which he depicts Hitler's questionable presence in Germany. While Mata organized the more practical aspects of life, from the beginning, she showed great interest in Leon's work. She was the first to read his text, and he accepted her thoughts and critique. 
During Hitler's quick rise to power in January 1933, the couple was on a skiing vacation in St. Anton, Switzerland. Recognizing the danger, Leon and Martha decided not to return to Germany, since Leon was publicly known as a Hitler opponent. First, they fled to southern France. However, in order to escape the quickly approaching German army, they had to flee the continent and reached America in the 1940s, thanks to an adventurous rescue. In France and later in America, the Feuchtwanger home became a known meeting point for emigrants. Martha arranged events around Leon's literary activities. She organized public readings, tea parties, evenings with music, and nurtured the atmosphere of a literary salon. After relocating for several times, in 1943, Martha fell in love with Villa Aurora, a house in the Pacific Palisades. It had stood empty after the bankruptcy of the developer and did not attract buyers. At that time, gas was rationed, gas prices were high, and few homeowners were willing to live in a steep hills far away from the city of Los Angeles, far away from schools, stores, and doctors. Bertolt Brecht comments about the remoteness of the house. There are only trees and hills. Once you are sick, there is no doctor. If you need a pharmacy, there is none. One cannot live so far from civilization. For Mata, the remoteness was not an issue. The neighborhood of the Pacific Palisades reminded her of Italy. She was not bothered by the horrible condition of the house so far from Los Angeles. She liked the view onto the Pacific Ocean and the Bay of Santa Monica. And in addition to the house, Leon and Mata purchased some more land. Mata planted a garden, created paths down the hill to the ocean. Some small bridges led over ravines and provided direct access to the ocean. For Mata, who was a passionate swimmer, this was an ideal place and swimming in the ocean was part of her daily activities. Even in exile, Leon enjoyed a successful writing career and so the couple was able to afford the necessary repair work and the long car rides to the house. Mata continued organizing social engagements in the villa, sending invitations to public readings and evenings of music and often serving her homemade apple strudel. Among the guests, one could see Charlie Chaplin, Fritz Lang, Ludwig Marcuse, Franz Werfel, Bertolt Brecht, Heinrich and Thomas Mann, Albert Einstein, and Arnold Schönberg. Mother was a person who self-confidently pursued her path in life, even in the face of severe challenges, such as the loss of her child, the experience of two world wars, exile from Nazi Germany, and even Leon's countless affairs with other women, she had an ability to continue despite setbacks. In her role as spouse, Mata always stood by Leon and fused his work into her sphere of life. Mata's biographer, Martin Manfred Flüge, maintains that while financially and socially dependent on her husband, Mata nevertheless held on to her own freedoms and independence, which Leon supported. Leon Feuchtwanger died in December 1958. His, his wife Martha survived him by almost 30 years. After the death of her husband, Martha was the executor of his literary estate. In The Four Lives of Martha Feuchtwanger, Manfred Flügge writes, In the end, she lived an ironic existence, a strange life. She was aware that an existence as a poet's widow can have grotesque connotations. She supposedly claimed that being a widow is not a profession. She accepted this role with some self-irony. Leon's life and work, now finished and part of academic research, had become part of her life, and like her house, had turned into a piece to be exhibited. She offered her opinions, was well acquainted with his work, as if it were her own. In a way, it was just that. After his death, Martha was more determined than ever to promote Leon's cultural legacy, to preserve his success and literary contributions for posterity. In this, she succeeded, even though she lived abroad and in exile far away from the two newly emerging post-war German nations. In his last will, Leon left his wife the house and all possessions. Throughout her marriage, Martha had supported her husband, his success, fame, and network with the literary world had been elements of her life. His death would not change this, as Mata continued placing her husband's achievements at the center of her life. 
Without heirs, Mata was worried about the future of Leon's literary heritage, as well as his extensive book collection. She had various options to consider since there were several universities in and around Los Angeles. Harald von Hofe, a personal friend of Marta and professor at the University of Southern California, stepped in and offered to establish a connection with his institution. Marta happily accepted. Only a few months after Leon's death, Hofe convinced Marta to sign over the books and the house to USC. In 1959, the following agreement between Marta and the university was established. The house and property, except Marta's clothing and jewelry, as well as Leon's extensive library, was to be administered by USC. The university agreed to take on all the costs for insurance and upkeep of the house. The contract also included that after Marta's death, USC would be able to sell the house and with the money, purchase space on university grounds that would house Leon's book collection. And we see the proof in front of our eyes. Leon's former secretary, Hilde Waldo, archived and cataloged the books while the university took on responsibility for the villa and Leon's books. In this way, Marta was able to live in the house until the end of her life. She was employed as the first curator of the Forstwanger Memorial Library and received a monthly salary from the university. Mata was happy that the house and Leon's book were preserved and that with the financial assistance of the university, she was able to administer and watch over Leon's inheritance. Flücke writes, Mata determinedly took on Leon's inheritance. With the help of Hilde Waldo, she managed the inheritance, the library, the house, and welcomed visitors from all over the world. Mata shaped Leon's image by doing business with the publishing houses, corresponding with scholars and journalists worldwide, and publicly speaking out whenever literary and biographical questions arose. She managed book and film rights, accepted invitations to symposia about Leon's work or exile in general. For visitors from all over the world, Mata gave tours throughout the house and kept the memory of Leon alive. Her dedication to this task is reflected in thank you letters. Visiting diplomats from Germany and England were taken by Mata's charm and sherry. She served during tours through the house. The guests marveled at Leon's book collection and supported Mata's mission of promoting and preserving Leon's memory. In this regard, the General Consul of Germany, Werner Montag, sent a thank you letter in 1968 to express his appreciation for the warm hospitality. Fascinated by her expertise and pedagogically well-crafted tour, where he gained a glimpse into the Feuchtwanger Memorial Library, he writes that as a small gesture of thank you, he wishes to replenish the sherry that is flowing among our guests and also add a bottle of French wine in honor of Mata's affection for France. The demand for tours was high so that Mata had to create a waiting list for visitors. In her correspondence with Peter Fürst, Mata explains in some detail how she conducted the tours. To visitors from all over the world, and especially to American and German professors and students, I show the library. I always start with the German classic collection, as this consists of first editions. The room is entirely surrounded by books. You can also see a tea cart where Leon and I used to have tea while he read from his manuscript. On the one side, there's the complete first edition of Goethe, which includes the first edition of Faust Part II, as well as a Heine first edition and a very rare edition of Heine's last poems that were found in his room in Paris. Then we walk to the biggest room with a view of the ocean to look at the international collection beginning with Greek and Latin books. Three steps up in the hall are Leon's works translated approximately into 30 languages among them Japanese, Chinese, and Indian. Then the first edition of Leon's publications, at least the ones that have not been destroyed. From the hall, we enter into the historical collection, one wall with world history, art history, music history, biographies, and philosophies. Then upstairs in the hall, the three Kupferbibeln, Bibles from Scheuse, as well as two luxury editions of Flavius Josephus. On the main wall, books in French about the French Revolution, Napoleon, and ancient regimes. Mata's social schedule became busier after Leon's death. 
At times, she would attend three different parties in one evening. She was invited in many official functions in Los Angeles and was a guest at consulates of different nations. Flügge writes about her demeanor. At times, she could be rather authoritarian, even bossy. However, with the right company, she revealed her humor and her ability to deliver a good punchline. She always had an anecdote ready about Alma Mahler, Werfe, Thomas Mann, Charlie Chaplin. She lived in an imaginary as well as in a real world that Leon had opened for her, but her last role with her distinctive and effective presence in Los Angeles is something she created all by herself. In time, Mata sought out contact with leading public officials in Germany. For example, in 1967, a partnership between Berlin and Los Angeles was initiated in which Mata was involved. Mata also revitalized her contact with Willy Brandt, whom she had met in the 1930s. When Brandt was foreign minister of West Germany, she asked him to change the name of her former residential street in Berlin back to Mahlerstraße. While Brandt did not grant her this wish, he invited Mata to come and visit Berlin. When the West Berlin Academy of the Arts created a special section and exhibit of the exile works of Leon Feuchtwanger, Mata accepted Willy Brandt's invitation with the result that in April 1969, she traveled for the first time since her first exile to post-war Germany. From this time on, Marta began to represent Leon to the world. While in Berlin, Marta enjoyed the exhibit devoted to Leon at the Academy of the Arts. In Berlin, she was shown plans for a Leon Feuchtwangerweg in a newly developed section of berlin Kropiusstadt. During her visit in 1967, she was invited to spend one day in East Berlin. The Aufbau Publishing House honored her with a banquet. During her day in East Germany, she met with Walter Janka, who at the time was working on a film script and adaptation of Leon Skoya novel. After her Berlin visit, Marta cultivated and strengthened these transatlantic connections even further. In the 1970s, she created a Leon Feuchtwanger Prize for historical prose. The prize is presented on July 7th, the anniversary of Leon's birthday, by the Berlin Academy of Arts. It's worth 7,500 euros and has been given yearly from 1971 to 1992 and a little less regularly subsequently. Mata's efforts to reach out to post-war Germany were met with interest and in turn sparked new transatlantic connections. In 1981, the journalist Volkes, Volkes Skierke traveled together with the newly elected Berlin mayor, Richard von Weizsäcker, to Los Angeles to personally get to know the 90-year-old Marta and wife of the author who wrote the novel Erfolg. Following this visit, Skerke published an article in the Süddeutsche Zeitung in which he describes his encounter with Marta. He presents her as a beautiful-looking woman who recounts Leon's life with much humor and wit. This encounter with Marta prompted Skerke to write a biography of Leon, which he published in 1984. Matas gave Skierka her full support, locating photos, documents, letters that she could find throughout the house. Mata Feuchtwanger died on October 25, 1987, at the age of 94. She was buried next to Leon in the Woodlawn Cemetery in Santa Monica. The increasingly dilapidated villa was going to be sold. Already in September 1987, lifelong friends of the Feuchtwangers such as USC professor Harald von Hofer, Ludwig Marcuse, professor Stanley Townsend, had informed the Feuchtwanger biographer Skerke, who then worked as a correspondent for the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Hamburg, about the appending sale of the villa. Skerke reacted quickly and was able to gain the support of leading German politicians, among them Chancellor Willy Brandt, as well as prominent authors, the German pen club, and numerous other well-known celebrities of public life and in the media. The German parliament reached a wide consensus, which included all political parties, to preserve the last and sole remaining cultural heritage site of exile. This was motivated by a desire to signal to the world that German post-war society had learned its historical lesson 
and that the exiles driven out by Nazi Germany are recognized as part of the German heritage. In December 1987, the university in California was told that there were efforts in Germany to provide donations to preserve the memory of Leon Feuchtwanger. It was the intention to maintain this German literary inheritance in Los Angeles and acknowledge its extraordinary significance for the exile community, as well as for Germany and the US. With the help of many public figures from politic and society, as well as institution, they succeeded in creating a kind of Villa Massimo for the Feuchtwanger home. In order to save the Feuchtwanger house, two foundations were founded in 1988. One in Berlin called Kreis der Freunde und Förderer der Villa Aurora e.V. and one in Los Angeles under the name Foundation for European American Relations. The German parliament dedicated public money from the Stiftung Deutsche Klassenlotterie Berlin and the German Foreign Office. In time, additional funds were made available as between 1992 and 1994 expensive and complicated renovations to secure the building had to be undertaken. After the villa was purchased by the foundation, the library, archive, furniture, and art remained in the possession of the university. The garden and house became property of the foundation and were placed under historical protection. In this way, Mata's memory work is continued and even expanded beyond her death due to the work of these German-American foundations. The villa was officially opened as an international artist retreat on December 1st, 1995, when the first fellow arrived, authors Irina Liebmann and artist Lisa Schmitz. Since 1995, there is an integrated administrative and program structure between Berlin and Los Angeles. The Berlin office is in the Jägerstraße 23 nearby the DDAD, DAAD, and manages the finances and the yearly selection of the fellows. In addition, there are transatlantic events which promote a lively cultural exchange between Berlin and Los Angeles, between Germany and the US. Among the events are film screenings, author readings, lectures, concerts, musical encounters between European and American composers, symposia, conferences, film premieres, discussions, and other special programs. The main focus of the La Aurora concentrates on the fellow programs for artists in residence. Each year, 16 artists are selected from area of film, music, visual art, and literature. The fellows are selected in Berlin and invited to stay at the Villa Aurora in Los Angeles for three months. In addition, there's also a one-year writers in exile stipend for an author who is forced to live in exile because of political persecution. In the final analysis, one has to acknowledge that Mata's self-chosen task to preserve Leon's heritage for posterity did succeed. The Villa Aurora became a memorial to Leon Feuchtwanger and to exile and grew into a place of work, artistic creation, and cultural exchange for young artists from all over the world. Every once in a while, the terrace, which provides a magical view of the ocean, turns into a venue for Hollywood parties when a German film is nominated for an Oscar. Manfred Flücke points out that the name Villa Aurora, which was used more commonly after 1987, seems fitting as it stands for continuity and new beginnings, for memory and collaboration, for creativity and reassurance. In 1995, the University of Southern California established the Feuchtwanger Memorial Library, which, are we, which we are celebrating today. The oldest and most valuable books, around 8,000 volumes, were placed in the climatized rooms of the USC library, which also accepts the personal estate of other German-speaking emigrants. The remaining 22,000 books stayed in the Villa Aurora. To enhance the scholarship of Leon Feuchtwang and other exiles, as well as spark new research directions, in 2001, researchers from the US and Europe founded the International Feuchtwanger Society. The society organizes conferences that meet every two years, once in Europe and once at USC and Villa Aurora in Los Angeles. It encourages scholarship and Feuchtwanger news by circulating a journal, as well as the Feuchtwanger study series, an anthology that publishes research about Feuchtwanger and other exiles during the Nazi regime. And Ian Wallace had a large take in all of this. 
At the end of my talk, I'd like to return to Martha. In a conversation with Reinhard Hofmeister, published in Zeugen des Jahrhunderts, Witnesses of the Century, Hofmeister notes that Martha Feuchtwanger organized her whole life around Leon, even after Leon's death. In the interview, Hofmeister asked Martha, did you never have the urge to create something of your own in your youth or later, something apart from Feuchtwanger or even something against him? Martha responded, I've always been only his wife. I was happy when he asked for my advice and I was allowed to participate. There was never a dull moment. To be with him was always exciting. I never entertained the thought to be on my own. Often I was offered to work as an actress. I never had a desire to do such a thing. When Hofmeister remarked that she had a major influence in Leon's success as a novelist, Martha deferred that this arose, on, this arose only out of necessity. She explained that when Leon was a young writer, he only wanted to write theater plays, and that she made it clear to him that novels would be more profitable. <laughs> With great confidence, Martha asserted, Ich habe ziemlichen Einfluss auf ihn gehabt. I had a lot of impact on him. Thank you very much. <laughs>